Hello and welcome back. Today is the promised exposition of T.S. Eliot's magnum opus, uh, in terms of poetry at least, uh, The Wasteland. Now, I want to begin this uh, exposition by giving a couple of disclaimers. Uh, one, this will not be a close reading, so I will not be going line by line and examining the actual uh, words of the text. I leave that up to um, interested persons and scholars, especially because there's been a lot of scholarly work done on the wasteland that is better than what I'm about to deliver. What I am uh, going to do is attempt to uh, take the roots and the key symbols of the wasteland and restate them in a way that the uh, average person can understand what Eliot is getting at. The thing about the wasteland is that it's a very complicated poem. It spans almost the entirety of Western literature and even has significant influence from Eastern sources. Uh, so the idea that I could sit down and, and um, you know, point out all the different ways uh, that Eliot is working with his material in the wasteland, the, the idea that I can do that, in a, especially in a video of reasonable length, uh, is quite silly. So, like I said, what I'm going to do is reserve myself to commenting on the key uh, largest symbols, how they're uh, referenced in the poem, and then what this means for uh, Eliot's uh, critique, uh, specifically of modernity. And that's the place I want to start here, is that Eliot is part of a school of poet, poets uh, and uh, poetry um, known as the High Modernists. And High Modernists uh, typically are thought of as being uh, against modernity or wanting to um, distance themselves from what they see as the cultural rot that uh, is in modernity or is a feature of modernity. And Eliot is sort of the arch-high modernist in this sense. And The Wasteland is sort of the thesis statement of those early 20th century poets and writers who really took issue with the kind of deracination and um, lack of meaning that we come to associate with modernity. And the way that he chose to combat this is to reconstruct this grand narrative using elements from uh, all different types of uh, literary traditions, which he, he does fairly effectively. So I want to talk a little bit about Eliot himself, and maybe that's helpful to get a little bit of background. Uh, and then we can move on to discussion of the poem. So this is from Eliot's biography, and I've I've pulled this up from uh, Britannica, um, just a regular reference source. Uh, T.S. Eliot's full name was Thomas Stearns Eliot. He was born on September 26, 1888 in St. Louis, Missouri, and he died on January 4, 1965 in London, England. And as you'll note, London is more or less the, the uh, setting of wide stretches of the poem. Uh, he was an American English poet. He also wrote plays. He was extensively involved in literary criticism. Uh, he was an editor and leader of the modernist movement in poetry, of course, with such works as The Wasteland and also The Four Quartets, which was published in 1943. Eliot exercised a strong influence on Anglo-American culture from the 1920s until late in the century. His experiments in diction, style, and versification revitalized English poetry, and in a series of critical essays, he shattered old orthodoxies and erected new ones. The publication of Four Quartets led to his recognition as the greatest living English poet and man of letters. And in 1948, he was awarded both the Order of Merit and the Nobel Prize for Literature. Now, I want to point out also that... Um, that the wasteland is a great example of the way that Eliot is a skilled poet, the way that he can uh, shift in and out of poetic diction into a conversational kind of speech, the way he can play with uh, meter, with rhyme and alliteration. And also, if you look at the poem on the page, the paragraph breaks between the stanzas are uh, poignant, and they serve to... 
uh, uh, sort of deepen the emotional appeal of the poem, I think. Um, and also, if you look at a copy of The Wasteland, usually it'll have Eliot's own notes uh, appended to it. Um, now, I'm not going to be basing uh, most of my um, exposition on Eliot's poem on his notes alone, although I will refer to them a little bit, especially where he points out things that he himself thought were important. The first thing I want to point out uh, is the introduction, and the introduction really sets the tone for the rest of the play. Now, he doesn't say it in his notes, but his introduction is implicitly a reference to the beginning of the general prologue of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I'll show you what I mean. So the first part of the wasteland is called The Burial of the Dead, and it begins like this. April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. So, uh, and then he goes on, right? Well, so in this introduction to the wasteland, he talks about April, uh, which is associated with, with rain, with spring, with renewal, as something that is painful to the narrator, as, as something that um, interrupts the coziness of their meager existence through the winter, where they subsist on dried tubers. So water is going to be a very influential symbol in this poem, as you'll see. But you'll you'll see, and I'm about to read from the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales, and you'll see how this is a parallel, but also an inversion. So the general prologue opens like this. And I'll, uh, I'll read with uh, the Middle English in mind, but um, uh, this is an English translation, or a modern English translation, I should say. When that Aprilis, with his sure suit, the drought of March hath pierced to the root, and bathed every vein in such liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the flower. When Zephyrus ache with his sweet breath, inspired hath in every holt and heath, the tender crops and the young sun hath in the ram his half-course run, and small fowls make melody that sleepen all night with open eye. So pricketh them nature in their carages, then long folk to go on pilgrimages. Now, my pronunciation with that is all over the place because I'm very much used to reading it in the Middle English where it frankly sounds better. But um, what I will say is that the presentation of April in the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales could not be more dissimilar than how Eliot uh, portrays it in the beginning of The Wasteland. And that's important because in the Canterbury Tales, which you know is a seminal English work of literature, uh, April brings on renewal, it brings on spring, rain, especially water, and it also brings on um, the virtues of the people. It, it impels them to go on pilgrimage. Specifically, the pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales are going to Canterbury uh, to the shrine of Thomas a Becket. Um, so you, you see then in the wasteland how this inversion plays out. So then the question that we're left to answer is, how could April go from being the cruelest month to, sorry, how could April go from having sweet showers to being the cruelest month? What has happened in English, in European history uh, to cause this change? And, and the short answer is uh, the First World War. Um, the long answer is the First World War and all its attended consequences and the social decay that preceded the First World War as well. So I w like I said, I'm not going to go through the poem in its entirety, but I do want to pick up on a couple of the, the primary images in the poem. I think the first one to talk about is the Fisher King. Now, the Fisher King is a character from Arthurian legend, and sometimes it's not 100% sure how Eliot is using, uh, or I should say, what specific um, 
iteration of the Fisher King that he has in mind because there are so many different um, portrayals. But in general, the Fisher King uh, in Arthurian legend, he is a king uh, possessing a castle along a river. I believe the castle is called Corbinic. And he has a thigh wound, which in uh, most scholars' opinion in, in that time period refers to a genital wound. Uh, and he's tasked, with, um, he's tasked with guarding the Holy Grail. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that because of his wound, uh, he cannot procreate. Uh, he cannot bring renewal to his castle, to his kingdom, and therefore the kingdom around him um, also suffers from this, this same problem, the same blight of sterility. Uh, the trees don't grow, crops don't grow, and the kingdom of the Fisher King is a wasteland. And the Fisher King, as a character, uh, comes up a couple of times. For example, he's in the beginning of the third part of uh, the Wasteland, uh, the Fire Sermon. And uh, I want you to notice some of the things that uh, the Fisher King, who is narrating here, um, some of the things he picks up on. He says, the river's tent is broken. The last fingers of a leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Tims run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles and sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed and their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors departed, had left no addresses. By the waters of the layman I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back, in a cold blast, I hear the rattle of the bones, and the chuckle spread from ear to ear. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank, while I was fishing in the dull canal. So some of the things he, he points out... Um, is that uh, he's, so he's talking about the, the Thames here, and of course then what we're associating then is the realm of the Fisher King with London, uh, which Eliot is surrounded by. Um, and he, what he sees in the, or what he doesn't see in the river, what he expects to see are silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, and other testimony of summer nights. So these are sort of the refuse of these profligate relationships that are increasingly occurring in modernity. And sex and relation between the sexes is going to be a, a super important theme in the wasteland. Um, this, this, I might have prefaced this talk by saying it's not for uh, children, but, uh, you know, for example, silk handkerchiefs uh, this time period would have been used by some as a form of condom. Uh, so, you would expect to find the sort of refuse in the river, but of course there's there's nothing in the river at this point of the Fisher King's narrow narrowization. Now the association of the Fisher King with uh, England or with the modern condition in general is is going to make a lot more sense once you get to the end of the poem to part five, what the thunder said. Um, when we're waiting around with the expectation of rain, of what brings renewal. But I want to I turn and look at another symbol. And like I said, this, this poem is, is largely about relations between the sexes. One of the ways that this is conveyed is through the device of Philomel. So Philomel is a character from uh, Greek mythology. She was the daughter of the Athenian king. Uh, her sister Procne marries a man named Tyrius. And Tyrius, after marrying Procne, uh, decides to rape uh, Philomel. And in the process of fleeing from Tyrius, um, her Procne and Philomel are transformed into nightingales. So throughout the the poem, 
effect where you see these sort of sorts of automatopoetic words, uh, the jug jugs and the twit twits. Um, these are um, uh, these are uh, connections back to Philomel and to the the transformation that she undergoes. It's very similar. Uh, you may be familiar with the story of Apollo and Daphne from Ovid's Metamorphosis. It's it's similar in a lot of ways to that story, and there is an implicit connection, uh, but between Philomel, the story of Philomel and between a lot of the different uh, romantic relationships that are displayed uh, in the poem. So, for example, in the beginning of a game of chess, the quote-unquote sylvan scene of Philomel by the barbarous king so rudely forced, is how the poem puts it, is hanging in the, uh, uh, the room of the uh, the painted lady, the the upper class woman who is uh, being described in the beginning of part two, a game of chess, um, and that whole part is is in some sense tinged by uh, that painting. And if you recall, the the two parts of a game of chess sort of display the breakdown of marital relations between uh, the upper class and the lower class. You see the the narrator in the beginning part of the uh, of that part, who is in some sense representative of the um, of the the woman's husband or her paramour. Uh, who, whatever the case may be, um, is detached uh, from her, and she she continually attempts to engage him in conversation, or just to attempt to get him to pay attention to her, to look at her, and he has his mind on on other things, on things uh, much more grave. But as you'll note, and if you go back and read that scene, uh, even his pensive uh, thoughts are interrupted by. Um, what in essence is the lyrics of a uh, pop music song, the uh, the Shakespearean rag portion of that scene. But it, it's much more pronounced in the second part of A Game of Chess, uh, which deals with a woman who is sitting at a pub who is talking to a friend of hers and uh, is describing... What, what in essence is, a, uh, so this friend of hers, uh, in order to stop having children, has taken abortifacient drugs, and this has caused her to lose her teeth. Her husband has given her uh, money for dentures, and she apparently has not uh, bought them. And so this, this conversation uh, plays out the dysfunction within these lower class marriages as well. And you know it's a pub because the uh, refrain in the middle, hurry up, please, it's time, which, you know, not only provides a sense of tension in, in the scene, it's also a very common refrain of uh, bar masters, or barkeepers, I should say, in English pubs. But I also want to pu pull attention to the end of that part, which ends with, uh, so, you know, there's this scene at the end, you can't, in some sense, you can't help but put a little bit of a Cockney spin on it, uh, but it's good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night, Tata. Good night. Good night. And then at the very end, good night, sweet ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. That is from Hamlet. That is the scene that Ophelia is singing right before she walks out of the scene. And then in the, in the uh, next scene where she's mentioned, we learn that she has fallen into the stream and drowned. So ultimately what's being communicated in this scene is, is, the, is the insanity that's reigning over these relations between the sexes. And, and it's especially highlighting a sort of predatory aspect that men have taken on in modern relationships, as uh, as we see in the scene with the carbuncular young man and the uh, the secretary or the typist. I can't remember what exactly she's referred to, but the carbuncular young man is displayed as uh, selfish, and and the the whole romantic interaction that they have uh, is very much portrayed in in terms that are. Uh, if not explicitly um, 
uh, implying rape are in some sense proximal to rape. There, there's definitely the sense that this is not um, this is not a loving exchange, and and uh, I would I would pull attention before we go back into the fire sermon. The actual title, A Game of Chess, uh, refers us to the play by Thomas Middleton, where he uses this device of the the chess game uh, to display relationships between uh, the Ang the English and the Spanish uh, during his time, so it's a political allegory. But really, it just gets us to Thomas Middleton, who um, Eliot notes in his own notes uh, as uh, contributing some of the thought towards this section from his play, Woman Beware, Women Beware Women. Uh, and in Women Beware Women, there is this complex web of adulterous relationships, but one of the the conceits that is used in the play is a as a chess game that is able to distract one character while another character is, uh, I believe, having an, an adulterous relationship in the in the other room. I'm not a hundred percent clear on my Thomas Middleton and my Jacobi Jacobean um, uh, theater because th and that is sort of T that was one of T. S. Eliot's uh, specialties was uh, Jacobean theater. So we've talked about the Fisher King. We've talked in some sense about the sexual politics that underlay the poem. Um, we could talk a little bit about the the um, the tarot card reading. But the, the interesting thing about the tarot card reading uh, is the Phoenician sailor who we get in part four. He's revisited in part four, which is Death by Water. And I think it's not hard to understand uh, how this is, in some sense, metaphorical of baptism. Baptism, of course, is a death of the self onto new life. Uh, but, of course, in some sense, in the modern era, we, we might think of baptism as being a kind of death, a death to the pleasures of the world. And, and the Phoenician sailor represents baptism as, as being something that's not Pleasant. The reason I say it's a, it's a model of baptism, of course, is if you just read it, it's a very short scene. Um, it sort of implies uh, Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under the sea picked his bones in whispers, and as he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool, Gentile or Jew. O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. I also want to point out, before we move on from the sexual politics of the poem, uh, the presence of Tiresias. Tiresias, of course, is a character from Greek mythology. If you know your, um, if you know your Greek tragedies, of course, if you uh, have read Oedipus Rex, or Oedipus the King by Sophocles, uh, Tiresias uh, shows up to essentially give these cryptic warnings about uh, all the things that are happening to Thebes. And the reason they're happening to Thebes, of course, is because of this uh, accidental, uh, accidental regicide and parricide that Oedipus has uh, committed, of course. Uh, Tiresias is actually singled out in Eliot's notes as being the most important observer in the play, and so I think it would be remiss if we didn't look at what Eliot pointed out. And he he points us to, um, let's see, I believe this is this is in the fire sermon. It's somewhere above the designation two thirty. He says, I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. He, the young carbuncular, arrives, a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious as he guesses the meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once, 
exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all, enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. So what is the importance of Tiresias to this scene? Well, if you know anything about the character of Tiresias, he is an oracle. Uh, he's also blind. So his, his blindness, in some sense, gives him this sort of heightened um, metaphysical sight, if you will. And then also the important thing about Tiresias is that at, at some point in, in the mythological story of Tiresias, he's transformed into a woman. So Tiresias has not only been a man, both a man and a woman, but he also has this kind of blind, uh, high interior sight. And so we're meant to see in Tiresias uh, a coming together of the sexes and also a, a vision, like I said, of the sexual relations that are displayed in the poem, which Eliot has a very bleak view of. And the sexual relations that are displayed within the poem, especially you know references to abortifacients, references to the use of um, contraception in the form of condoms, uh, but also just the, the lovelessness, the sterility, and the dryness of the relations between men and women. And there's also an implicit uh, reference somewhere in the fire sermon, I believe, to homosexuality. Um, all of these contribute to the sterility of the wasteland. Right. So then we'll move on to the religious uh, dynamics of the poem, and then we'll be done. So firstly, in part, th part three is titled The Fire Sermon. This is important because the, this is a reference to a sermon that was given by the Buddha. It's uh, contained in the Pali Canon of Theravada Buddhism, uh, which was translated uh, sometime before Eliot's time. And El Eliot uh, chose this to use as uh, a device because he wanted to uh, he wanted to unite the best of asceticism in the East and the West in this, uh, in this particular part of the poem. So in the Fire Sermon, Buddha actually, the Buddha, I'm sorry, actually talks about uh, liberation from suffering through dividing oneself or, or, or um, uh, subordinating one's uh, senses. So in some sense, this is the, this is the Eastern approach to asceticism. Um, but he also implicitly connects this, or sorry, not implicitly, explicitly he connects this in his notes uh, to the Sermon on the Mount by uh, Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, Christ on the ser during the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about things which I would, I would see as being um, in some sense similar to what the Buddha is talking about in that he's talking about appearances not being reality. Of course, on the ser during the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the Beatitudes, right? So the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, you know, the the you know the opposite of what you would expect to happen is happening. And he also talks about those who would come into the kingdom uh, professing that they had good works and that they did all in the name of Christ. Who he says to them, "Depart from me, for I never knew you." So th this is also an, an implicit connection to the idea that appearances are not reality. Those who appear pious are not always, in fact, pious. And also there's a connection in the fire sermon to uh, Augustine's confessions. And I would say there's a connection to uh, the Punic Wars, uh, if only a small connection, towards the end of the fire sermon. Uh, he's quoting in some, he, in a mixed sense, from uh, Augustine's Confessions. To Carthage then I came, burning, 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 burning. O Lord, thou pluckest me out. O Lord, thou pluckest burning. And so I think the fire sermon is interesting to note because it, it talks about asceticism, and, and maybe I'm reading T.S. Eliot wrong here, but it seems to me like the asceticism that's being discussed is sort of a stopgap measure as we're still waiting for the rain. And the, the act of waiting on the rain, in some sense, 
is almost an eschatological uh, thing. It, 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 is, it does seem in some sense that the rain is not coming until the very end. At least it's not coming until the end of the poem. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, if you've read through to the end of the play, the, the water, the rain does not come. There is thunder, which implies the coming of the water, but it, it's not actually there at the, at the end of the poem which is interesting. And the last connection to, um, to Eastern thought, to Eastern religion, is um, the, the portion towards the end of uh, what the thunder said. So we have the da uh, before every stanza here. This is likely the, an onomatopoetic representation of uh, thunder crackling. Um, but I've also seen critics try to connect this to... Um, you know, the, the word dad or father, or especially Abba, which is uh, what the word Jesus Christ used uses to connect himself to God the Father. I think that's a, a little bit of a stretch of interpretation, but I don't think it's necessarily wrong. But you'll note that the uh, what follows here after every da is one of the principles that's spoken of in the... Give me a moment here. The Brahada Ran the Brihada Ran Yeka Upanishad, which is uh, a uh, philosophical text uh, from the East. And the terms uh, data means to give, uh, Dayaravam means compassion or sympathy, and Damyata is self control. And you can actually see this in each of the um, in each of the stanzas, that the stanza representing data, uh, what have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Okay, so diaravam, compassion. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn only once. We think of the key, each in his prison. Thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall, ethereal rumors revive for a moment. A broken Coriolanus. Okay. And then Damyata. The boat responded gaily to the hand, expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. And then, of course, the last stanza of the poem is, in some sense, we are again talking about the Fisher King. We're again talking about the coming of the rain. Um, it's interesting, actually, um, that uh, he uses the... He, he uses towards the end of the, the poem the phrase Hieronymo's Mad Again, which was the subtitle of the Spanish tragedy by... Um, I believe it's Thomas Kidd, and if you've read the Spanish tragedy, it's a uh, it's a revenge play uh, it's, that's uh, quite bloody, and so I, I don't think it it bodes well for the um, prophesied coming of the rain. But of course, the poem then ends with the um, with the pronouncement "Shanti, Shanti, Shanti," which is um, in, which I believe means inner peace, uh, and is recited at the end of prayers. Uh, in um, in Eastern practice. So yeah, that's um, <laughs> if I were to go on any more, I think I would I would be thoroughly confusing. Uh, and even then, I think this this rant has been somewhat confusing since it's been delivered uh, extemporaneously. But never never you mind that. Um, I hope this has given you guys some things to think about in the play. And I certainly don't think of myself as a uh, unbiased or a uh, interpreter who is not subject to error. So if you disagree with any of my interpretations, I fully encourage you to uh, bring that up in the comment section. Of course, you, I, I would love for people to like and subscribe, naturally, uh, if you want to see more things like this, more expositions on poetry and more uh, modernist poetry or poetry of any sort. Um, this is the sort of thing that I enjoy doing, literary criticism. Uh, so, without further ado, I, th I think I'm going to end it here. I will just—I would just like to say there is much, much more to the wasteland than what I have 
talked about here. And I encourage uh, people to really get into it and study it because I do believe it is one of the greatest poems of the modern era. And in it, I think, relies the key lies, I mean, the key to a lot of uh, reactionary thought and conservative traditional beliefs going forward into the modern world and how we reconcile that loss of tradition and loss, the loss that's attendant with modernity um, with, uh, you know, our belief that things uh, will come about, will get better. Um, and it, it is worth noting w with some amount of hope that, you know, Eliot himself uh, was confirmed uh, into the Anglican uh, Church. So, you know, his own his own journey in faith uh, was was interesting to say the least, but I think we're all undergoing a journey in faith, and I think one of the, one of the key roads along that journey to faith is to be able to look over to look over and to see the wasteland, what some people very flippantly regard as the culture of death, but really it's a culture of sterility that grips the modern world, and hopefully we will look to that and see the need for renewal. But at any rate, that's all I have to say on the wasteland. I hope you have a great day, a blessed day, and thank you for tuning in. I will now be signing off.